Between Asia and the West, Russia is the world's biggest country. The splendor of its landscapes and the richness of its heritage are impressive. Moscow, St. Petersburg, and so many other places. This is a journey off the beaten track to discover eternal Russia and the polar circle. In the west of the city, historic Arbat Street is renowned for its cultural addresses and shops. From the days of the Russian nobility to the Soviet era, it has preserved its prestige and shows its best side in the morning, before the crowds arrive. Nearby, one of the seven skyscrapers built in the 40s and 50s, known as the Seven Sisters, is home to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The buildings, commissioned by Stalin to commemorate Moscow's eighth centenary, are scattered across the capital. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Kremlin is the largest fortress in Europe. Its Grand Palace is the official residence of the President of the Russian Federation. Next to it, Cathedral Square displays all its splendor. The tallest steeple is that of Ivan the Great. The Kremlin's towers, whose red color echoes that of the fortress walls, also bear witness to the city's religious past. Beneath the communist red star, the Spaskaya Tower's clock is an important landmark for Muscovites. Also known as the St. Saviour's Tower, its door has long been thought of as holy. All men, the Tsar included, had to remove their headgear as they passed the icon of Christ. The multicolored cupolas of St. Basil's Cathedral typify traditional Russian architecture. Originally, the cathedral was white with golden cupolas. Legend has it that Ivan the Terrible, who ordered it to be built, had his architect's eyes put out so that he could never replicate his masterpiece. The world-famous Red Square takes its name from the word Krasny, meaning red and beautiful. Besides the Kremlin's walled necropolis, Lenin's mausoleum is built into a wall at the foot of one of the towers. Sometimes reflected on the walls of the mausoleum, Gum is an immense department store dating back to the 17th century. This shrine to capitalism survived communism to become one of Moscow's most famous monuments. Near the historic museum on a bronze plaque is Point Zero, which marks Russia's Kilometer Zero. It's said that fortune may smile upon anyone who stands there and throws a coin over their shoulder. An important destination for pilgrims, the Cathedral of Christ the Savior was built in 1839, before being demolished on the orders of Stalin to make way for a popular swimming pool. Rebuilt in the late 90s, it's now the seat of the Patriarch, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Reliefs on its south face represent Moses and his sister Miriam. Nearby, a scene showing the apparition of the Archangel Michael, and to the right, Barak the warrior and Deborah the prophetess. Below that, there are bas-reliefs of other saints, including John the Baptist and the Apostle Thomas. The interior is captivating in its monumental dimensions, notably its 30-meter diameter cupola and the remarkable reconstitution of its frescoes. This icon shows the family of Tsar Nicholas II today worshipped by some as a saint. 
These are his throne and his wife's. Orthodox worshippers consider icons as a source of blessings. They petition them with prayer for their protection and goodwill, often kissing the glass that protects them. Ancient treasures in chests are also venerated. Inside this one are kept the writings of St. John Chrysostom, one of the fathers of the Orthodox Church. Here, the holy relics of Basil the Great, John the Baptist, and the victorious Alexander Nevsky. To the right of the altar lie the remains of one of the first metropolitan bishops, Filaret of Moscow. The nave is impressive. Its vast dimensions and uncommonly high ceiling were designed to accommodate thousands of worshippers. The Gregorian chants heard here are exceptional. Father Michael is officiating today. On the last weekend of the month, the most precious relics are brought before the faithful. A piece of a dress belonging to the Virgin Mary and one of the nails from the crucifixion of Jesus. They are kept safe in their two cases. Photos of them do exist, but today it's forbidden to film them at all. In a more secular scenario, an aficionado offers tours of Moscow in this Soviet-era van. Its Russian name is Bukanka, which means round loaf, a reference to its rounded shape. An unusual visit offered by Sergei, a child of perestroika. This is the car of my youth. Every summer, my family and I would climb into this van to go and gather mushrooms and berries. We used to do it every year. It's a tradition that's engraved on my memory. Even the smell of the engine brings back childhood memories. I worked as a lawyer for 10 years. Then suddenly I had the urge to share my love of this city and introduce people to its welcoming nature. And that's when I had the idea of showing people around my hometown aboard this mythical vehicle. Originally designed for the Russian army as an emergency vehicle, it gradually became popular with many families and young travelers, thanks to its reliable engine and its storage capacity. It is a fully authentic period piece, apart from its leather cushions. Not far from Red Square is one of the city's most significant buildings, the Bolshoi Theater. On top of its roof, Apollo's chariot, symbolizing the victory of good over evil, of light over darkness. On the first floor, next to the main staircase, is the imperial box, once reserved for the Tsar. It is double locked and well guarded. Nowadays, it's reserved for the president of the Federation. During his reign, Stalin, feeling the box was not safe in case of an attempt on his life, would use a box on a lower floor, closer to the exit. Above the central balcony is the emblem of the Russian crown, a two-headed eagle, looking both towards the west and towards Asia. The acoustics in this hall are recognized as some of the best in the world. Nestling at the very top of the room, Muses evoke the sanctity of artistic creation. On stage, one of the theater's stars is meticulously fine-tuning her dance steps before the show. And backstage, the mezzo-soprano Ekaterina Voronsova is warming up her vocal cords. The Bolshoi, for me, is a place full of history, 
There's a special ambience here, which influences how you perform. Performing at the Bolshoi is a great responsibility. Today, I'm playing Rosaline in Rossini's opera, The Barber of Seville. I still have a long way to go, but for me, being able to play a main role at the Bolshoi is an achievement. Everyone who comes to Moscow comes to the Bolshoi, not necessarily for the show, but for the monument. It's one of the most amazing places in Moscow and in the whole country. The Bolshoi is really big, really Bolshoi. Throughout the winter, when the sky gets dark, the streets adorn their robes of light. Many Muscovites prefer their city at night at this time of year. Nikolskaya Street, close to Red Square, is lit up by thousands of twinkling garlands. Ten kilometers from the town center is the world's biggest ice skating rink. Over 4,500 people can skate together on its 20,000 square meters. It sits in the heart of VDNK Park, an entertainment complex, including museums and vast halls that present fairs and exhibitions. On the Central Avenue, the House of the Russian People leads to a statue of Lenin, leader of the Bolshevik movement and founder of the Soviet state. Among the most striking edifices is the Azerbaijan Pavilion, and that of Armenia, Back to the town center and a visit to the metro. The main form of public transport for Muscovites, it is also a veritable underground museum. At Revolution Square station, you can stroke the nose of this border guard's dog, which is supposed to bring luck. On the platforms and in the corridors, 76 bronze sculptures represent heroes of the revolution men and women whose acts symbolized the values of communism. Another interesting place is Novoslobodskaya with its colorful stained glass windows. The most famous station is Kievskaya. 24 mosaic panels tell the story of Ukraine in the days of the Soviet Union and paint an idealized picture of the daily family life and work of its people. There are also portraits of significant figures, such as Lenin and the writer Pushkin. His facial features reveal his African origins, which he got from his great-grandfather, Abraham Hannibal, a slave freed by Tsar Peter the Great, whom he was very close to. A famous tea salon and gastronomic restaurant bears his name. It was created in the wake of the success of the song Nathalie by the French singer Gilbert Becot that tells the story of a romantic tryst in a then imaginary Pushkin cafe. At the weekend, the Pushkin Cafe offers Franco-Russian gastronomy 24 hours a day.
with its carved woodwork, mouldings and sophisticated accessories, everything is designed to make sure the enjoyment of hand-brewed hot chocolate is a moment of luxury. Moscow was built on hills, so in winter there's no need to leave the city to enjoy a spot of skiing. Close to the Nagornaya metro station, the 59 hectares of the Kant Sports Center has 17 tracks and ski lifts. 350 meters of slopes to hurtle down among the skyscrapers. After school, budding champions come here to practice their slalom skills and enjoy the thrill of competition. There are also training courses for beginners. One activity that unites young and old is without doubt vatrushki, inflatable sledges. They are so called because of the resemblance to vatrushka, a traditional brioche made with cream cheese. In the north of the city is Moscow's Great Mosque, built in 2015. Bearing witness to the country's religious diversity, it's one of the biggest mosques in Europe. Islam is Russia's second religion after Russian Orthodox Christianity. Built in the Byzantine style, its building was supervised by a Tatar painter and its murals by Turkish calligraphers. The impressive chandelier in the main hall is worth the trip by itself. Made of hundreds of pieces of crystal and covered in gold leaf, it weighs a ton and a half and measures four meters by seven. The dome is covered with 12 tons of gold leaf. The shape of the minarets is a reference to the towers of the Moscow Kremlin, but also those of Kazan, the capital of the Russian Republic of Tatarstan, which is mainly Muslim. Next stop, Volgorechensk, which is about 400 kilometers northeast of Moscow, on the banks of the longest river in Europe, the Volga. In winter, it blends in with the snowy landscape. For almost 50 years, this has been one of the country's main caviar production sites. It's close to the city's hydroelectric center, and its hot water emissions give the landscape a dreamlike appearance, as well as providing good conditions for breeding fish all year round. Sturgeons have become rare in the wild. These days, they are bred in vast basins right next to the river as close as possible to their original natural habitat. While the flesh of these fish is delicious, their eggs, the famous caviar, have a very high market value. Production manager Slava likes to come here to enjoy the landscape and check the quality of the farm's produce. Caviar is our region's black gold. The town is very proud of us. Our farm also preserves nature, as we don't kill the mother sturgeons. And as we don't kill them, they can produce more eggs.
Close to the Volga is Slava's fish farm, where the young fish grow before returning to the river and its basins. When the females are ready, they are brought back here for their eggs to be collected. Rinsing, draining and canning are all done by hand. The final sorting is even done with tweezers, a job worthy of a jeweller. Forty kilometers along the Volga is the town of Kostroma, where people come to visit the former royal city and walk along the banks of the river. In Kostroma, there is also the home of Snegoroshka, the daughter of the snow, and granddaughter of Grandfather Frost, the Russian version of Santa Claus. Its origins are in a children's story written here in 1873 by Alexander Nikolaevich Ostrovsky, the founder of Russian theater. She is an idealized evocation of purity and female beauty. Visitors can put on a princess dress and a crown and enjoy a momentary return to their childhood days, reflected in the mirror. In a nearby workshop, Anastasia creates typically Russian fur hats called chapka and fur coats. Fur is not seen as a luxury in the northern parts of Russia, where its primary function is protection from the extreme cold. Anastasia grew up in this context and today has become the creator of trendy fashions while still working as an artisan. I've been around Chapka since I was a child. I was born in Chukotka, in the far north of Russia. As everyone knows, it gets extremely cold there. We lived miles from anywhere. You can't go out without wearing something on your head and a very warm coat. My father used to go out hunting in the tundra to get food for us. My mother would work with the fur from the animals that my father brought back from the hunt. So I'd wear fur coats and chapkas, as the temperature there could reach minus 60 degrees Celsius. St. Petersburg on the shores of the Baltic Sea is the second biggest city in Russia. It was the capital until 1917, when the revolution broke out. It's crisscrossed by the river Neva and many canals, which is why it is known as the Venice of the Baltics. It has around a hundred bridges, including the Bridge of Kisses, 
Legend has it that any lovers who kiss here will never be parted. People attach padlocks as a symbol of their devotion to their lover. Some of the bridges are named after their color, like the Red Bridge or the Green Bridge. The latter provides access to the city's main thoroughfare, Nevsky Prospect. Its perspective is often mentioned in Russian literature, as is the unique architecture of the city, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There are many statues and unusual decorative details, such as on the Lion Bridge, where passers-by touch the wings for luck. Visible from the Nevsky Prospect is the Cathedral on the Blood, one of the symbols of St. Petersburg. Its medieval Russian architecture makes it stand out from the essentially Baroque and neoclassical style of the city. Tsar Alexander III ordered it to be built on the spot where his father was assassinated by a revolutionary, hence its name, the Cathedral on the Blood. Over 7,500 square meters of mosaics depict mainly evangelical scenes. A few minutes away on the banks of the Neva, the Hermitage Museum houses the world's largest collection of works of art. Built between the 18th and 19th centuries, this was the residential palace of the monarchs who over time accumulated their private collections. Some three million sculptures, paintings and other objects are exhibited in over 350 rooms. The Pavilion Room is the museum's most popular. It mainly owes its fame to this 18th century clock, a gift to Catherine II from Gregory Potemkin, her favorite. It's composed of an owl, representing the darkness of night, a cockerel, representing the sun, and a peacock, symbolizing rebirth. Together, they represent the eternal cycle of day and night. The room itself is a veritable masterpiece. White marble columns, gildings and molding capture the light all year round. 28 crystal chandeliers gleam like a thousand flames. There are several rooms devoted to the Italian Renaissance. One of them dedicated to works by Leonardo da Vinci, including the Madonna Lita, the Virgin with Child. Experts will notice that the mountain landscape in the background is typical of Leonardo's experiments with perspective. However, the work is the subject of controversy, as some experts believe it was completed by one of the master's assistants. Nearby, these doors display a spectacular marquetry made of tortoise shell. Other paintings are scattered everywhere from chimney breast to ceiling. There are frescoes inspired by Greek mythology, including Amphitrite, goddess of the seas, and the gods of Olympus. Nearby, Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Return of the Prodigal Son, depicts a ruined son returning to his father. The painting reflects the artist's genius, who, through his brushes, illustrates the power of compassion. In the city centre is the fortress of Peter and Paul, the founding site of St. Petersburg. Peter the Great selected this location to defend against Swedish attacks. 
Known for its old prison, visitors come here to see the cathedral where almost all of the Tsars of the Romanov dynasty are buried. This is the tomb of Peter the Great. And here, that of Catherine II. There is an ancient tradition popular throughout the country. Russian baths, known as banya. The Mitninskie banyas are the oldest in the city. A wood-fired sauna is heated to 120 degrees, then people are gently whipped with bunches of twigs called veniki. Then a specialist applies a treatment made from pine, birch and other essences, each with its own benefits. Eric has worked here for over 10 years and knows all the secrets of this totally natural treatment. I'm the smoke master at the Midninsky Baths. You have to warm up every muscle and bone in the body. You cover the body with bunches of oak, birch, juniper, spruce and Caucasus eucalyptus branches. It's a treatment that boosts your immune system. Being a good smoke mast is quite simple. You just have to love your patient. When you love them, you understand their needs. Every day, the task of clearing snow from the city roofs takes place to avoid ice buildup and protect the pavements. And you'd better not find yourself underneath. St. Petersburg has a great diversity of religious communities. The great Choral Synagogue, the second biggest in Europe, is one example of this. It was built in the late 19th century during the reign of Alexander II, who wanted to reduce the residential restrictions of the city's Jews. Despite the rigors of the Stalinian period and World War II, its doors were hardly ever closed. Significant renovation work has restored its initial style, a blend of Moorish and Byzantine design. In the Great Hall, a selection of photos and costumes depict Orthodox Jewish wedding traditions. A few hundred meters away is the Marinsky Theater, one of St. Petersburg's most important sites. It was the Russian Empire's first permanent theater. When it was founded in 1784, it was called the Bolshoi, before changing its name to Kirovsk in the Soviet era. It has been called Marinsky since 1992. It has retained its Renaissance Baroque style and its molding depicting actors' faces, expressing different emotions. On the ceiling, the clock with cupids, a work by the Milanese artist Enrico Francioli. It's surrounded by 12 medallion portraits of famous authors, such as Ostrovsky and Gogol. Above the imperial box is the theater's shield, marked with the initials of the Empress Maria Alexandrovna, wife of Alexander II, who contributed to the creation of the Marinsky. Only guests of honor are allowed the privilege of sitting here to watch a show. Alexander Sergeyev has danced at the Marinsky for over 16 years. Every time I step on this stage, I feel the weight of this place's history.
Every step I make has great responsibility. I still get stage fright even after 16 years. You really have to warm up well to help you concentrate and not get nervous. In the region of St. Petersburg, the village of Vechni Mandrogi is a veritable curiosity. This fishing village was deserted by its inhabitants during the Finnish occupation that took place in World War II. It was rebuilt in the 1990s, inspired by traditional Russian craftsmanship. Ice hockey is very popular in Russia, and it's even more fun with boots on. These felt shoes, called Valenki, are thought to have Mongolian origins. The biggest in the world is here in Mandrogi. It's two and a half meters high and is giant size. Crafts are one of the village's main activities, notably the fabrication of matryoshkas, the famous nesting Russian dolls. Made from birch or linden wood, every one is painted by hand. The oldest models date from the late 19th century. This one is more than 50 years old. Olga spends many an hour bringing to life these figures, which, without colors or designs, would all look the same. I've been painting matryoshkas for 25 years. It gives me a great deal of pleasure. It's like meditation to me. I lose all sense of time. I escape my everyday life and go into a world of my own. While the majority of these creations represent peasant women, there are many other themes. Princesses, musicians, conductors, anything is possible even a personalized matryoshka. Not far away, a small museum is a reminder that Russia is the home of the world's most popular spirit, vodka. There are 3,607 bottles on display here, in a variety of forms, such as crowns, statues, and even Fabergé eggs. There are also old tools used in the different stages of turning cereals into alcohol. Period photographs bear witness to its role in Russian social life. Pictures on the ceiling remind the observer that the distillation process has its origins in ancient Egypt, where it was used in perfume making. This beverage has been a part of Russia's collective memory for centuries. Two hundred kilometers east of Vekti Mandrogi, in the Republic of Karelia, is Lake Onega, lying in the midst of an archipelago of around 5,000 islands and islets, including the famous Kiji Island. During the winter, Boris takes tourists around by hovercraft. 
Sliding across the ice to Kiji is a huge pleasure. You feel like you're flying over the ice flows. To be a good pilot, you have to get plenty of experience. It's not all that complicated, but you do need experience. The architecture of Kiji Island, called Pogost, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Church of the Transfiguration, the most imposing, displays 22 aspen-covered bulbs. These buildings were constructed in the 18th century. They are made entirely of wood and were assembled without a single nail. In 1959, every piece was itemized before it was dismantled for restoration. There are signs on the church facade that serve as a reminder that the island was once a pagan sacred site. Its graves are also a testament to this diversity. The Church of the Intercession, the only one that's heated in winter, features a number of iconostases. These icon-covered panels are typical of wooden Orthodox churches, where it's not possible to create frescoes directly on the wall. This one depicts the Last Judgment. It was placed at the church's exit to remind the faithful what life awaited them behind the doors. This is the descent into hell. These are tempting demons. Lake Oniga, which surrounds Kiji Island, is one of Russia's largest. Its depth can reach 30 meters. It's popular for its hole fishing. The minus 35 degree temperature does nothing to dampen the ardor of Nikolai and Ilya, who come here regularly to drill through the ice. Look, look, look! I've got a bite. It's a little bass. Isn't it lovely? During the week, I take tourists on a snowmobile safari in the forest and around the lake. And at the weekend, we go fishing. We're Karelian and we love this tradition. They aren't biting, but I'm glad we've got five already. Other people make holes in the ice all over the lake and come back with nothing. We don't just come here for the fishing, but also to spend quality time with friends. Anyway, how are your dogs? The dogs are fine. Do you only have huskies? Yes, just huskies, and even two racing dogs from Alaska. How many have you got? A pack of 44 dogs. Oh, 44! But today I'm going to have a team of eight. When Nikolai and his dogs get home, it's time for training. Huskies are used to conditions in the far north, and the sled teams are not assembled at random. Each dog has a specific position, based on whether it's a leader or a follower, and its seniority in the pack. An unforgettable and authentic way of discovering the Karelian landscape. Our journey now takes us further north, to the region of Murmansk. Every day, Maxim goes to work by sled, and every day begins with a stream of invective at his reindeer. Where are you going? 
Come on, come on, come on. I should have used the other ones, they're quicker. These are like a bunch of tortoises. Come on, come on. I went all around the island yesterday. You can still see my tracks. The tracks next to them were made by my other reindeer, the quicker ones. That tent belongs to my fishermen friends. This guide works for the Ogni Imandri resort on the shores of Lake Imandra. He takes tourists on sled trips and teaches them all about the culture of the Sami ethnicity, the legendary people who live in the north of the polar circle. For the occasion, the resort has recreated a typical Sami village, where you can learn to hunt reindeer with a lasso and fire a bow and arrow. Shamanism is a prevalent part of Sami culture. In his traditional style hut, Oleg weaves a link between the spirit and human worlds using his reindeer hide drum. Legend has it that a demigod married a human woman and their children were the first Sami. The Sami believed that reindeer blood ran through their veins. They used reindeer for transportation, food, clothing and making homes. In the heart of winter, temperatures can plunge below minus 40 degrees. Trees protect themselves from the icy cold thanks to a thick blanket of snow, which offers a more clement zero degrees. Everyone here protects themselves from the extreme cold, at least almost everyone. Even at 40 degrees below zero, some hardy souls take pleasure in immersing themselves almost naked into the icy water. Every Sunday morning, a few kilometers from Ogni Imandri in the town of Apatiti, Svetlana gets ready to have a swim in Russia's biggest ice hole. This refreshing dip is a local tradition, believed to have benefits for the immune system. In the afternoon, all the inhabitants meet in the center of Apatiti for a much-awaited event, an ice carving competition. Armed with chainsaws and a variety of other tools, the country's best artists have 90 minutes to turn huge blocks of ice into works of art. This year's official theme is love. Ice sculpture is very popular here. The low temperatures allow the works to last for several months. A few kilometers away, is the Kibini mountain range, where significant mineral deposits were found in the 1920s. A popular ski resort, Kirovsk, has been here for nearly 60 years. At the bottom of the slopes, an unusual place grabs the attention, the snow village. Spanning over 2,000 square meters, snow and ice sculptures are embellished by a light show. This is a homage to Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. After midnight, tourists get the chance to go on an Aurora Borealis hunt. Alexander accompanies them on this nocturnal excursion. Aurora Borealis are created by the collision between particles charged by solar winds and the high atmosphere close to the magnetic poles. The Aurora Borealis bring tourists from all over the world to Russia. You can predict the Aurora Borealis. We have good tools for doing it. You can observe it with satellites. But having said that, it isn't possible to predict them with any certainty. You need luck too. Alongside him in the car this evening, another expert has come to try his luck. 
Valentin is a photographer who specializes in the aurora borealis. Aurora borealis are always different. There's never two the same. They express beauty, surprise and wonder. Even though I've photographed lots of them, they still amaze me. The secret of being an aurora borealis hunter is to dress warmly. Otherwise you might freeze to death before you've seen one. The most amazing aurora borealis I've seen was in the Kibini Mountains, and that wasn't predicted. Some friends and I just went to watch a meteorite shower. The colors were unbelievable. There was green, red, purple, and even yellow. Valentin has collected his best photos in a book that is in great demand. But for those who do not have the courage to wait all night for the northern lights in 40 degrees below zero, with a little luck, you could enjoy them soaking in a Nordic bath at over 50 degrees. From the vibrant atmosphere of Moscow and St. Petersburg to the edges of the North Pole, the Russian spirit has many faces. Its culture and natural world are rich with a thousand reasons to visit time and again.